Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Committee of Council. Um, today, at uh, the first item, of approval of agenda. Before I go to the board, I'm going to um, ask Council or Committee to allow item 8.3.1, the presentation in economic development, be brought forward just before item 7.2.1 when we get to that. Um, also, Councillor Willens is on vacation. Councillor Dillons uh, will be here. He's running late due to personal reasons. Councillor Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to add an item. I'm not sure whether it's 6.3 or 6.5. Uh, a matter came up yesterday about provincial funding at the BIA meeting, and I was hoping to get some clarification or ask. So it's kind of a question, but it might, uh, it might evolve into asking staff to report back. Okay. What's the subject for provincial funding it's for what? provincial, I don't know. Oh, just provincial, provincial funding. Provincial funding for, uh, and, okay. and somehow the BIA have some information, but not sufficient information to report to the board. Okay. Okay, item 8.3.2. Provincial funding. Mayor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Chair. I wonder if, uh, because it's the, uh, Valentine's Day, that we could add an announcement by the fire department since they put out a press release speaking about Valentine's Day. Absolutely. Announcements. That will be under announcements 4.1. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair Councillor Miles. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Under Public Works, I'd like to add an item, um, Snow Removal Financial Assistance Program. 6.3.1. Okay, any, anybody else? Uh, Councilor Miles, you'll move approval of agenda. All in I favor? That loses. All in favor? That carries. And there are any declarations of conflict of interest? Seeing none, consent agenda. Would anybody like to add, move, delete, Mayor Jeffrey? Uh, <coughs> Mr. Chair, can I suggest that we put 9.2.2 into uh, consent? I believe this is a housekeeping item, just to help move our agenda along. Okay, 9.2.2. Nine point two point two is administrative authority policy. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Mayor Jeffrey, you move consent. Yep. All in favor? That carries. Uh, under announcements, we have item we have four point one fire video that was uh, recently added. Uh, who's taking this over, Chief? Mayor Jeffrey, yep. Can I just start? Um, so the Brampton Fire Department put out a press release, which I kind of disagree with slightly. Uh, they said, forget the chocolates this Valentine's Day. And I actually don't think you should ever forget the chocolates on Valentine's Day. But I agree with them when they say, nothing says I love you more than a working smoke alarm. And I believe the uh, Fire Department's put together a good video, and they're working with us to try and promote this because... Uh, if you don't have time to exit your home, uh, that is the most valuable uh, thing you can give somebody that you love to care for them. So I asked the chief if he'd show the video and uh, give us a little update. Great. Chief? Um, thank you, Mayor Jeffrey, members of the committee. Maybe we'll play the video first and I'll say a few words. Thank you. Sounds good. Oh, 
thank you very much. So I really do want to thank uh, the two actors they do work with the, the City of Brampton, Victoria and Prince, and also to Aaron and our Strategic Communications uh, Department for helping us put these messages out. So that is very much appreciated. But it does bring up a very important public safety message, and that is you need to have working smoke alarms. Um, and unfortunately, this message is not being heard in our community and across the province. Um, people each year will, be, will die or be injured in fires because of not having working smoke alarms. So this is a, a priority for Brampton Fire and Emergency Services. Um, one year ago, we tragically lost three Brampton residents in a fire, um, and we don't want that to ever happen again. And this is happening across the province where people aren't having working smoke alarms and people are dying. So we do have to get the message out. It's a simple concept. You need to have working smoke alarms so you can easily and early detection uh, of the fire. And with that, you need to have a home escape plan. You need to have two ways out. Um, and as I said, public education is a priority um, for us in Brampton Fire, for myself as a chief and for every member of our organization. We have to change people's behavior to get this message out and reduce the risk to the community. So I encourage everyone in this room, everybody watching at home, to go home, make sure you have working smoke and carbon monoxide alarms, and have a happy and safe Valentine's Day. Thank you. Excellent, Chief. Well done. <clears throat> Council Moore. Thank you. I'm sure I'm not the only one that's guilty of this. But uh, it seems to me that the smoke alarms that capture any um, uh, smoke or whatever from the kitchen area tends to get disengaged because I, we've all burnt toast. We've all, uh, listen, I've got an exhaust fan over my stove that would suck up a small dog. It is that <laughs> strong. That's why I have a big dog. But, you know, I... I, I, you know, I've been in friends' houses where, you know, and I know I've done it. You take it, the battery out, or ours is hooked up, yeah. you know, so you've, um, but, but it gets disengaged because people um, are sick of trying to, you know, yes. have that beep stop while they're trying to prepare a meal. No, through, through the chair, that is that is a problem. Uh, a lot of the new alarms have a hush feature on them, so you can use that. If you check out our website, there's information about how to properly install them and where to properly install them. Never take a back, uh, battery out. Never disable them because uh, they need to be there, uh, when you, especially when you're sleeping at night. That's typically when we see a lot of these fires. But mm -hmm. again, we have to keep it top of mind. It's, it's easy to uh, be complacent or not think about it or think about other life events and stressors. So just want to take the time to remind everybody and... Be safe. Yeah, well, we just changed ours in January because Rona Good. had them all on sale with the hush feature on it. So Great. I said, you're going to buy one of those. But a lot of people are, are not. And, and so I think there's a lot of homes in the city and probably everywhere that have that uh, that particular smoke alarm. Yes, uh, most, of them, most of them will have that now. And you can get a 10-year uh, sealed battery as well. That's right. That will last for 10 years. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I guess just an additional question to that. Um, with the new development going up in Brampton, do we <clears throat> uh, do we uh, mandate that all uh, smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors have to be hardwired into the new build? So through the chair, that will be in the building code. Uh, in the, the newest uh, version of the building code, they also have the smoke and CO alarms that are hardwired and interconnected, but also the um, visual strobes. You may see those in, in very new homes. So yep. when that goes off, uh, you will, the alarm will go off, but you also see that visual strobe that's very, very uh, apparent and visible. Good. Great. Okay. Um, our next item is delegation, delegation 5.1. Um, from Parade Cor Command, uh, Commander and Poppy Trust Fund Chair, Royal Canadian Legion, Branch 15, Certificate of Appreciation for the City's contribution to the 217 uh, Poppy Campaign. Welcome, sir. Good morning, Chair, and to all the members of Council. Uh, I'm here today uh, to talk about the Poppy Campaign last year. Uh, it ran, we started the Poppy Campaign with the raising of the flag at the, on the last Friday in October, uh, and it ran until November the uh, the 11th, obviously. Uh, through that time, uh, we also, for the first time, put banners on Main Street, uh, um, visualizing Vex both past and present, and we uh, produced an excellent video that we showed in council at one point in time as well. Um, we have raised uh, $73,000 in our poppy campaign. Um, we did an excellent Remembrance Day parade. Uh, everything went off very well. It was very cold, but we got it done. 
uh, and the fly pack happened, and I want, I'm here to thank the city for the contribution. There's the team. Stand up, everybody. <coughs> There's the city's team. And Mr. Darling here. And Mr. Darling. So we come from, I, I have a certificate from Ontario Provincial Command of the Royal Canadian Legion and the Royal Canadian Legion Branch 15 Brampton. Uh, we'd like to give to the city at this point. And if I could ask the mayor and the councillors to come down, uh, and we'll do it right here, and we'll take a very quick picture and get you back to your meeting. Excellent. All right? For sure. Very good. Remember? Rob? Rob. Well, you can do it. Okay. Where do you want to? You stay with you. Okay. That way, people don't stay too long. <laughs> That's the plot. Yeah. Yep. Uh, our next delegation is uh, regarding the memorial wall adjacent to the center of town. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm looking for my PowerPoint to come up. There we go. All right, so November the 11th in 2018 marks the 100th anniversary of the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. In other words, the end of the First World War. We're not forwarding. It is game first. It is game. Now go ahead. There we go. Okay. Now, we have a very good record in Brampton uh, in terms of memorial functions. Uh, we do a Vimy Parade every year and service. We do a Decoration Day Parade near D-Day in June of every year, Veterans of Foreign Engagements on July 1st of every year, and the conference we've already talked about the Poppy Campaign, uh, the annual Remembrance Day Dinner, the Candlelight Vigil, the Sunrise Service, and the main Remembrance Day Parade. No other community does as much as we do, and we lead the way in that. Um, but here's the Brampton's biggest kept secret. On the picture on the left, you see the front of the cenotaph and the brass plate uh, which has uh, the <clears throat> coat of arms of the old town of Brampton. Behind that plate is a metal box. And in that metal box is Brampton's uh, Book of Remembrance, or otherwise known as the Memorial Book. It contains the names of the soldiers of Brampton who died overseas in the First World War and the Second World War. There are approximately 80 names from the First World War and about 72, 73 from the Second World War. Nobody knows it's there. Nobody knows their names. When you actually lay a wreath on Remembrance Day, you're laying a wreath to them. That's what the whole wreath laying is about. And that's why it's at the front of the cenotaph underneath that plaque. But nobody knows that they're there. Okay. So what we're proposing <clears throat> is to build a wall. Um, the, the wall will be, uh, I'll get to location in a minute, um, but it will be situated on the grass uh, behind the cenotaph. The dimensions are approximately four feet high, about 10 to 12 feet long and about two and a half feet wide. Now the one thing about this, and the way the design is made, is that I understand there's some talk about either refurbishing or redesigning Ken Willem Square. This memorial, the way it's designed now, can be picked up and moved. You're gonna need a big truck and a crane, right? But it can be moved uh, if later on uh, there's a, a redesign of the square. Um, the material will be as close as possible uh, to, the, to the material of the cenotaph to make a, a companion piece. And on it will be engraved the names of everyone who's in the memorial book, plus those who died overseas on duty in Korea, Afghanistan, and yes, we have one, 
uh, UN and NATO deployment. There are two under there, Bramptonians, both who I knew personally. Um, and it will incorporate elements of the cenotaph in its, in its design so that it's a, a truly a companion piece. So here's what it will look like in a basic drawing. Uh, there will be the wreath on the top, maple leaf on the bottom. Uh, it will be the same front and back. Okay, the names of the First World War will go on the front and everybody else on the back. And you'll be able to, where it's located, you'll be able to walk around it and see it. Okay. So the wreath, well, let's look at the top picture first. On the bottom, we've put the, uh, the maple leaf with a scroll. Well, that comes right off the cenotaph. That's on the cenotaph right above the plaque. Okay, so you can see that on that picture. The corners will be the same as the, co as the pictures on the left. Okay, the wreath on the top will be the wreath that's on the top of the cenotaph. On the sides, we will take the swords of justice that are on the uh, cenotaph and put them on the, on the end pieces of, of the monument. So it will tie in very nicely. So that's a, a quick look at the front. You see the wreath at the top, maple leaf on the bottom, swords on the side. And the wording is, the city of Brampton gratefully remembers those who made the ultimate sacrifice in the service of our country. World War I will be on the front. World War II, Korea, United Nations, uh, NATO, and Afghanistan on the rear. Location, you can see on the red circle there, it's behind the cenotaph and the grass there. Uh, part of it will be under that tree, part of it will be out in the sunshine. And from a ground view, you see it there. Okay. And there's more than enough room to do it there. Unveiling, it's hoped that we can do this and unveil it on Remembrance Day in 2018. Time is short for that. Uh, it's not impossible, but if it can't be done, then what we'll do is when we open the poppy campaign, we'll do a ceremonial sod turn, and we will unveil it when we do our Bimmy Parade in April 2019. That's plan B. But ideally, if we can move quickly on it, then we'll, we'll go for Remembrance Day. Material costs and funding. All right, we're looking at, for the cost of the, uh, the wall itself and construction, it's estimated at twelve to 15000 However, you need to build a foundation, you need an architect, you need an engineer, you need electrical engineers, etc., uh, and all of that added on, landscaping, all of that added on is another thirty-five to forty. so you're looking at fifty-five dollars to $60,000, okay? What I am looking for is funding, uh, well, first of all, we want approval to actually build this thing, but I will be approaching federal and provincial uh, government uh, to look for funding there. Uh, the Legion, Brent Swifting Legion, I will be talking to them tonight uh, at our meeting to uh, make a contribution of roughly $10,000. However, that is subject to um, approval from our provincial command structure. Um, and so even though we may have a unanimous vote tonight, we still have to get it approved up the, up the ladder. Uh, but, and I do anticipate a unanimous vote tonight. Okay. So, but I will be approaching the federal and provincial governments uh, to pay a third and a third. So we're asking for a motion today to approve the project in principle, subject to a staff report, uh, to be submitted to full council at the, at the staff's earliest convenience. That's my presentation. Thank I'm you. subject to any questions that you may have. Mayor Jeffries on the board. Mayor Jeffries. So, so thank you for bringing this forward. Um, and it is our practice at this council to wait till we have information before we approve, even in principle. So it, it has nothing to do whether we whether we like the project or not. Right. And I think obviously you also need to get some of your ducks in a row yes. uh, from your side. So I, I think that th that a staff report will help inform what you do on a go forward basis and what we do. And I think I'm prepared to move a motion to send it to staff to come back with. Um, a recommendation. I think you have uh, identified that this is a very ambitious target from a time perspective. Yes. Um, I think it would be a miracle <laughs> uh, for you to achieve the, the timing that you're hoping for. So I, I think we need to be reasonable and uh, methodical. I think there are some very good examples. Um, something much smaller was built at the province of Ontario in front of Queen's Park. And uh, as I said to you earlier, I would reach out to the Speaker's office to find out how they did it because uh, you don't really need to reinvent the wheel and I think there's some really good suggestions that they could make to uh, help make the project we do go even more quickly. So uh, 
I'm happy to assist you in those conversations with Thank federal you. or provincial members. And uh, certainly I think this would be easier for us to navigate uh, in our future budget proposal and when we know the, the true costs of, of what you're proposing. So, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to move the report, uh, move this to a report of our staff to come back for a future <coughs> conversation. But I think everybody around this table is pleased that you told us Brampton's best kept secret <laughs> um, and that we do want to honor our veterans and uh, I think we're happy to work with you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Council Mark. Thank you, and I certainly would support sending this back to staff for, um, for a report to come back. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Book of Remembrance that, as the Mayor says, is the Brampton's best kept secret. Mm -hmm. We've had a problem over the past few years in Brampton where somebody has stolen a lot of the brass plaques from monuments around the city. Mm -hmm. um, I know that this one is very prominent and um, you know, with security, but sometimes with, even with the best of, of security, things can go missing. So it concerns me that the brass plaque is on the cenotaph with something that is, quite frankly, priceless mm -hmm. behind it. We can replace the plaque, but we can't replace the, uh, the Book of Remembrance. So um, I, I guess I just put that out there. I don't know if staff even knew that the book was there, and we've done our best to try and um, protect those brass plaques that didn't get stolen across the city. Um, I don't know, maybe at some point we can get a report on whether or not they've been replaced. Um, yeah, I know the one at uh, Church and, and Scott Street uh, went missing a few years ago, and I don't know whether it's been replaced yet or not, but it should be. But I put that out there just as something, um, like I said. My understanding with respect to this particular plaque, now there are three screws. Because uh, in 2013, we actually refurbished the book and had it uh, uh, had Pam look at it and, and did some uh, conservation work on it, and we put it back in. Uh, there are three screws, and it looks like that's the only thing holding that plaque on. But my understanding is that that plaque is also epoxied on. Uh, that's my understanding. And if that's the case, that's very secure. Well, either way, I think we need to do a little bit of um, investigation here and make sure that it is secure and safe. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Councilor Moore. Um, just on uh, Mayor Jeffrey's uh, motion, um, what I'd like to see in the report coming back is, uh, I don't know if, I, I, I like that area, I, I can picture in my mind where, where you want to put it. Um, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's big enough. Um, oh, I pasted it out. It's big enough. I don't know if the, I'm not talking about the area, I'm talking about the actual wall. Oh, I, I don't see. know if the okay. wall is big enough. I know the, uh, I love the look of the center tap now, but, uh, I, you know, of course I wish it was a little bit bigger. Um, so therefore, I, I don't know if that wall is, is the right size or not. I don't want something to get kind of lost in everything else that's going on in, in uh, Kenwell Square there. So I'd like to understand if, you know, if we can go bigger, if, is that the right spot? Um, and I'd like that to be included in the report, if that's okay. So I don't have anything written, but I think everybody understands what the motion is. All in favor? That carries. Madam Mayor, you'll move for receipt of the delegation as well. All in favor? That carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Council. You're working. Our next item is an added item by Councillor Miles, item 6.3.1. <coughs> Councillor Miles, you put your name on the list and I'll... Turn your mic on. Put your name on this. Perfect. Okay. Um, I guess my question is through you to Mr. Petushka. Um, and I've just, these are questions that have been raised by some senior citizens in the community in regards to our snow removal financial assistance program. So I know there are, are good reasons why we, we have the eligi eligibility criteria that we have. But uh, I'm just wondering how much flexibility there is in this program. I'm going to give you the for instance. So this particular couple came to see me about their application for assistance. The husband is 75 and the wife He's married to a much younger woman. <laughs> she's in her, she's not 65 yet, so she's in her early 60s. 
and neither one of them are, are capable of shoveling snow, but they don't qualify. So, I mean, it's not, she's not in a wheelchair, so in order, the house is in her name, and in order for them to apply, she would have to be, um, have some kind of physical disability, be in a wheelchair, etc. So, is there, do we have any flexibility built into this? <coughs> Through you, Mr. Chair, I think uh, what you should do, uh, Councillor, yeah. is, is send that particular instance to me so we can re-review it. Okay. Their other question is, is in regards to the criteria where, and, and this was from another senior, um, you know how they have to tr track the exact dates that someone comes and removes their snow? Well, they were wondering why they couldn't just, for the winter, say, if they get $200, they contract with a neighbor or someone to come and do snow removal for the sum of $200 and submit one amount. Can they do that? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the invoices that are collected at the end of the winter season, we're very uh, liberal as to how we interpret those invoices, so uh, I, I don't think that would be a concern. Okay. But it would have to be an after, not a before. It will be an after, not a before. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's all. That's it. Okay. Uh, that concludes public works. Is there any questions on anything that they heard or anybody that pertains to, pertains to public works? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to community services. Uh, we have no staff presentations. We have a report that was brought forward, item 8.3.1, which is a staff presentation, I believe. Councillor Moore. Do you want to, you're on the board, would you like to speak before the presentation? No, follow Okay. <coughs> University. Okay. 8.3.1 was brought forward prior to 7.2.1. Mr. Sager. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, and members of Council. Uh, I'll just give you a quick update that ties into the, the report that you're going to be discussing with the Commissioner of Community Services. Uh, last update, we mentioned that the CAO and myself will be meeting with a couple of senior colleagues at the uh, Government of Ontario and with the President and senior staff at the University, Ryerson University. Those meetings occurred. Uh, the first meeting was with the new Deputy Minister at the uh, Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Uh, first chance for Harry to meet this colleague and uh, get build a relationship with the university uh, ministry that will be overseeing both post-secondary institutions and how they do the academic and other programming. So as we're creating the new post-secondary institution, we're starting to build that. Also getting an update from the deputy about the status of the review. Uh, regrettably, there was no timetable, but that the review is continuing, the uh, announcements coming forward, but no date, which I think is the one issue we're all looking for and hoping for. Secondly, we met with the President uh, Lachemi, who also spoke at the September 6th State of the City and gave a pretty, fairly open and transparent address about his views. Uh, in that meeting, we had the special advisor who is leading the work with the province, and also a new colleague, the executive lead for the Brampton Initiative, who had been the acting provo, uh, senior colleague within the Ryerson uh, establishment, uh, Dr. Chris Evans. And I wanted to make that with on because this is the first time we've had a chance to work with Ryerson at a strategic level, linking all the activities they're going to be doing here rather than this part, this part, this part. And this ties into the report because Dr. Evans met with us, the CEO, the commissioner, several staff to have an idea of what we've been doing in Brampton, the acquisitions we've been making that help think through the campus in downtown, how it ties into the other initiatives, whether it's uh, the reimagine, the uh, mobility hub, and other activities, how this is their investment in the city and ours will help transform the downtown. And he, he came up by the GO train, so he got a good sense of how the GO train will interact with the uh, uh, campus. And then we took him. Uh, Commissioner uh, Menendez took, uh, asked Dr. Evans to 
visits a number of the sites in the downtown, starting at the Gage Park, walking them through to get a sense of the potential student experience. And after that, we had a discussion on the key elements that we prepared and our September 6th report to you about how do we coordinate a number of things with Ryerson and the MOU between Ryerson and ourselves. And as a result of his efforts, we're, uh, myself and the commissioner, are going to establish weekly meetings with Dr. Evans to help drive the coordination of the two buildings and also help develop this MOU. So when the province announces, we can report back to you about the province initial announcement, the economic impact of statement, and importantly, for our investment, what are the commitments back from Ryerson? What are our commitments to Ryerson to help establish this new university? But key to that is moving forward in conjunction with Ryerson. So I just want to set that stage prior to the report. Are there any questions? Okay. Council Moore? Uh, can I speak to the we can bring and, the, and the report? We can bring the report forward, item 7.2.1 at this time. Well, we're all political creatures around here, so I think we figured out that the announcement mm -hmm. is probably going to be pretty close to the election. And quite frankly, I don't care as long as it's for more than 1,000 students and more than 90 million. Mm -hmm. So they can pick the time that they want to announce it, as long as it's better than um, uh, what we had anticipated from previous announcements. Um, on the on 7.2.1, um, reading the report, uh, absolutely I support the report. But I'd like to put something out there that's a little different. I was This uh, BCEIC doesn't register in my brain as something I can always remember. So I was, um, when I read the report, I thought, can we just... Can I, I'm going to put this out there as something that we can uh, refer to this as something better. Downtown Brampton, we've talked about it being center ice. Center ice along the Kitchener-Waterloo-Toronto corridor. We, I've heard Bob Darling say it. We are, Br Brampton is center ice. We talk about the Rose Theatre as a performing arts venue that people achieve, you know, with, with their performances and whatnot. They come to in our downtown Brampton, center ice. So I'd like to propose that we refer to our BCEIC, that we just rework, rework the, the letters and come up with center ice. Because, um, you know, I don't know how staff feel about that around here, but, you know, it's, it's, it's just taking the existing letters, Brampton Center for Innovation, Collaboration, and education because I have to keep trying to think of you know okay so what are the three I know it's innovation um, and so on so I'm going to put that out. I'm going to refer to it as center ice because that's what Brampton is we are center ice thank you council more Councilor Sporvieri uh, thank you Mr. Chairman uh, thank you Bob for the uh, update um, I, I, I hope that uh, you're right, Councillor, about the uh, announcement. I, I just hope that uh, you know they they don't want to wait till the, the after the election's over. Maybe they're hoping, they don't know what. To, in case they don't, I don't know what's going to happen if they don't win. If uh, the commitment is still going to be, um, it's if it's still going to be um, uh, held, the uh, commitment to build a university in Brampton. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm really getting squeaky. I'm really getting uh, a little nervous that um, this announcement has been postponed again, and, uh, and what their intentions are. But um, uh, the question I have um, through Mr. Chairman is to the Mr. Bob is: uh, There's been, uh, and I, I'm sure you're aware that there's been quite a lot of talk uh, in the community, uh, especially the business community, about the location of the library of the um, uh, university downtown Brampton. Um, there seems to be. I've been reading some stuff coming through to me, and um, there seems to be uh, some uh, concern amongst the downtown business community that if uh, if this uh, site is not properly chosen, it could really do uh, a lot of uh, uh, negative effects to the downtown, and and you know somehow I kind of um, you know I I'm hearing them 
because I do agree that we must have the proper location. And, um, and, and we've never really gone to an exercise to look at what is the proper location for Brampton, what are the advantages of one over the other, and, what, uh, and should council take a position and say, we believe that this is the location that the council, uh, based on our research and our uh, uh, consulting with the community and, and, the, and, the, and the business community and the downtown community, we feel that this is the location that we, we prefer as a council. We've never done that, and I'm just wondering whether we should be doing that. Um, and I uh, just like to get your view on that, whether you. Councilor Sporvieri, um, we have council has gone through that exercise. No, no, no. We yeah, we yeah, went through no. an exercise no, to several. see kind of what was the best sites. No, we haven't. We haven't. No, I don't believe so. <coughs> Uh, I'm seeing a lot of heads going. Yes, we have. Well, uh, did we pick a number of sites, at possible sites, or one best site? I can't say that council uh, said, you know, that's the site. Yeah, I don't but think we did. We we did have a presentation okay. to members of council, and we chose us. Uh, we 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 did determine what is the best we, site. We don't get to choose what the best site is. Well, I I understand that, but I believe that the council okay, should Bob. have a, a view. Uh, through the chair to the councillor, uh, you're right, uh, chair and uh, business member council. Uh, my colleague uh, Michelle McCollum took you through a, a good discussion of potential sites across the city, and then there was a, a, a strong sense, if not unanimous, uh, that the preferred general site would be the downtown. <coughs> There's also an indication that this would be a Ryerson decision, and at the meeting on September 6th, when the president spoke to the issues that the councillor raised, he took it in a view as that they're looking at a preferred site now. <coughs> But there are multiple sites. They do plan to continue to invest in the city. They do not see the student numbers ending at 2,000, more five to 10,000, so there's more buildings. And he left open the site that there'd be future opportunities down the road, sooner in his preference, but that's the direction. But no, uh, it wasn't a specific site, but the preference is to be in the downtown core to help drive that. In addition, with the uh, Commissioner of uh, Community Services' efforts on implementing the center ice, there'll be another facility in the downtown core to go with this, to build that kind of campus feel. So there, I, my sense is once the community sees the full, they'll start saying this is going to have a significant impact on the downtown business community and, of course, throughout the city. Thank you, Chair. Well, so Mr. Chairman, uh, I believe that staff is going through an exercise, and I, maybe we, we should uh, get an, uh, an update on that and uh, uh, on the developing um, the, a transit hub for Brampton. Uh, I believe that that's something that was, was in the works. Uh, uh, there was a review for the terminal down, the transit terminal downtown. I believe, uh, I remember a couple of years ago when we were debating the LRT and uh, we were told that um, the present site is presently not, it is not sufficiently large enough uh, to accommodate the, the growth that's going to happen. It's already congested as it is. We all know that. Anyone who drives through there can tell that it's, uh, and I believe that we were told that there was an, an exercise going through uh, reviewing uh, the, the transit terminal downtown. Is that still ongoing or has that been done or, or is that just something we were told uh, just to kind of, you know, uh, kind of uh, distract the uh, council from, um, you know, uh, from that issue? Alex, through the chair, um, you know, clearly we've been working very closely with all, all uh, parties, part of the Queen Street Master Plan, uh, part of the uh, realignment uh, review that uh, Commissioner Petushka is doing, uh, and clearly with the university. So we're looking at all those studies and looking at how we integrate best in, in an area that can accommodate uh, and sustain our future growth in transit with a downtown mobility hub of some type. So that's definitely uh, a, a lot of links between all parties on that one. And, and, and through the, uh, through you, thank you for that, Alex. And uh, are is staff also looking at uh, what are the and I we've seen some really nice renderings, uh, and I think I got them here. I kept them because it looks so nice of the downtown, and and it showed uh, a lot of. Um, uh, intense, intensified development around the existing uh, 
uh, terminal or the uh, the train station at Serenal, the GO station. Uh, it it's all has this beautiful high-rise uh, development uh, that uh, that's envisioned. And so, I, from my view, um, depending what happens with this university site, it, it could um, it could disrupt or or uh, affect the the vision that Brampton staff has uh, brought brought to us in the past. So you know, I, I certainly don't don't want that lost opportunity to have that opportunity to, to lose that opportunity to have uh, this great intensification uh, around the. Uh, the train station, where most likely is the most logical place that should uh, that should happen, and you know if um, I mean if uh, the Ryerson decides they want to pluck their uh, site right there, I mean to me that's not good for Brampton. You know the university is good for Brampton, but if we have several locations uh, that are available that are possibilities, I, I think you know we we should sit back and just. Uh, let it happen. I think we should be proactive and uh, and determine what what is the best uh, what is the best site for Brampton, and council should make that decision. Council Provier, Mr. Stein. Thank you. I, I want to assure council and the public that we're looking at this in a very integrated fashion. There's nothing going to be jeopardized mm -hmm. at all in the uh, downtown reimagined project. It's all being integrated. The mobility hub, where the university is going to be located where some of the developments are going is all integrated and the community will see something pretty fascinating once once the decision is made by the province to move forward. There's no concerns on, on, on our well, part. Well, and I'm, I appreciate your, uh, Ms. Harry's uh, comments on that, but we don't know what the, uh, the Ryerson or the province are going to, we don't have an idea what they're going to choose and it could interfere with our vision. Is, is it safe to say that the communication is open between Ryerson and Sheridan? So they know that we don't want our vision to be disrupted or to be affected. Then. Safe to say that they know what our vision is? In fact, they want to help enhance the vision. So there's no concerns. This is, this is totally aligned and, and the, the community will see something pretty fascinating that will add to the vision of this, of this community. Excellent. Well, Councilor Well, that's fine. Well, I'm fine with that as long as I get that reassurance. and. Hopefully that will uh, unfold that way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, through the Chair. Um, and here, I, I assume uh, um, our planning vision that uh, we're developing that's going to be delivered in the next couple months encompasses all this in an integrated fashion and, and really shows uh, our full potential. Yeah, I think, you know, that the, the downtown reimagine really encompasses the more short-term but the planning vision and entails many of this as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Moore, you'll move uh, item 7.2.1. All in favor? That carries. Councillor Sproveri, you'll uh, move receipt of 8.3.1. All in favor? That carries. Uh, that concludes the corporate or community services. Um, are there any questions by members of council pertaining to community services? <coughs> Seeing none. As we pulled the only item out of economic development. Oh, my apologies. Councillor Bowman, would you like to take the chair? Sure, I'll, I'll just do it from here. There's, there's one item that uh, we had added, 8.3.2, um, provincial funding, and that was Councillor Moore. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday at the uh, BIA meeting, the executive director... Uh, reported to the board that uh, they were waiting for more information that they had been contacted actually about some provincial funding uh, nobody seemed to know what the ministry or what ministry it was that contacted them and and the name it was provincial funding announcement in March is expected for Main Street revitalization digital Main Street do we have any, and they sort of looked to, she looked to members of council as if we had, were able to bring a, uh, an update on that, and of course none of us had heard of it at all. Herman Custodio, a business owner on downtown Brampton, was aware of it because he had been contacted, apparently by the ministry as well, to be a part of uh, this provincial announcement, but he was not at liberty to share with us any details. Are we... 
do we have any information on this? But it seems when we've got a lot of, just from the previous conversation, we've got a lot of balls in the air, you know, in terms of what's happening in the downtown. And if there's a provincial announcement that's somehow involving a local business downtown or, or and or the BIA, we should probably be aware of it. So through the chair, um, to Councillor Moore, um, I'll reach out to the executive director this morning and uh, find out exactly what was mentioned at the meeting yesterday and provide council an update. Okay, that's fine, but she didn't have any information. But we haven't heard anything. She didn't have any more information. She may know the ministry. But um, uh, yeah, we haven't heard anything. Okay, I'll leave it in your good hands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Moore. Seeing no other questions, uh, we will move on to the Council question period. Does anybody have any questions about anything presented from economic development today? Seeing none, we will move on to corporate services section and Chair Miles. Thank you very much. We're going to start off with a report from Mr. Patari regarding the Smart Cities Challenge. Is there any questions from members of council on this? A $50 million competition that the City of Brampton is getting ready to um, embark in. Chair Bowman. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, this is, a, this is a, a huge initiative by the government, and we're going to be entering it. Um, we're, we're entering what category of it? Where do we think that Brampton is going to uh, be able to put forward programs that meet the criteria? Through the Chair, we'll be uh, entering it to win the prize for the up to $50 million dollar the largest prize available through the program. And in terms of timing, we have to get our challenge statement put together and submitted by the end of April, April 24th specifically. Uh, but what's exciting about it is we're in a, a, a really tremendous position given the great groundwork uh, done through a number of community engagement initiatives, in particular through planning vision that gives us a sense of some areas to further assess and probe with our residents over the next you know month or two to, to really come up with that challenge statement we also have some innovative IT solutions that we're that are award-winning so we think in a very short period of time it's not going to be easy but we're going to do it and we're excited um, we're going to be putting together a great team across the city to get that done we're going to be reaching out to uh, consultants who specialize in helping municipalities put these proposals together we're in it to win it and um, once that submission goes in in April, we hope to hear back later on in the year that uh, we are one of five recipients, hopefully, uh, to, and the, the feds will give us $250,000 to develop a more detailed proposal submission with a detailed work plan on how we're actually going to be successful. And then the year after that, we would find out if we won the 50. We're, we are going to find out we're going to win the 50 million. <laughs> We're in it to win it. We are. Uh, no, I, I think it's important, Joe, that, that people understand that this is not, you know, the, the entry that we put together by the end of April is not going to be the one that gets the $50 million. That's, that's in order to get us into the five, into the final five. And then they provide us a quarter million dollars to go and put the whole thing together to, uh, to get some assistance with the plan. And that's when we go forward to win it. That, that is correct. And later on this year, once the consultants have uh, helped us uh, complete the community engagement, which is a very strong criteria for the selection uh, jury to look at and evaluate, uh, we will be coming back prior to submitting the, on that April 24th to council to give you an update in terms of what we heard from the community, what our positioning is as a city, and present to you our challenge statement that we will be submitting. Okay. And, and all the... All the community input that we've been gathering from all the various master plans, the arts and culture plan, will that all be able to be part of this, um, the input that we submit to them? 
So through the chair, that will be fully leveraged and available to us as staff as well as the consultants who help us do it. We still do need to go back in very focused ways back to the community to refine a, a very specific challenge statement. Because one of the criteria uh, along with the engagement piece is in fact making a significant change uh, with respect to outcomes in a very measurable way. So one of the uh, successful candidates in the U.S. who won their Smart Cities Challenge was Columbus, Ohio. And their, what they were trying to achieve is reducing infant mortality rates. Uh, it was a great story, but the underpinning to that success was in fact leveraging its technology and its transit. That, and, and that was the big piece, and everyone's going to try and leverage that. We know we have the best-in-class transit system in this country, headed up by an exceptional general manager, and we're going to be working together on this to ensure that we leverage transit. Our, our mobility uh, work that we're doing, one of our game changers is our regional connections. This, I'm really excited. I think we're in a great position to, to really be successful here. I agree with you 100%. We have an exceptional group of people at that table out there. So I'm looking forward to the announcement that we are the $50 million recipient. So yes, go for it. Thank you. Okay. Um, are you going to move the report? Well, I think Councillor Moore is on the board. You can still move it. I would love to move the report. Okay. Councillor Moore? Well, it's nice to see our senior management team is a mutual admiration club. <laughs> but nice to see you all getting along. I think you should put together the team uh, that put together the Amazon bid. And, and I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but I, I, I tell you that that was the most amazing team that pulled it together. There's a lot of corporations, both in the public and the private sector, that talk about breaking down silos. And if, if that's one of the themes... I think the City of Brampton is at the head of the pack on that. You proved through the collaborative work of that team to put together the bid for the Amazon, uh, or put together the Amazon bid, that um, we broke down the silos. And everybody worked and pulled up, you know, rolled up their sleeves and just put together an outstanding uh, submission. So I have no doubt that we'll have a uh, first-in-class submission for this as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, no more speakers on the board. It's been moved by Councillor Bowman. All in favor? That's carried. Uh, next item on the agenda is a report on building a culture of respect. It's here um, as a status update for members of council. Councillor Moore? Oh, are you, is that from before? Uh, I, I have no speakers. I have a speaker. Okay, now now I have a speaker, Councillor Sprovieri. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just um, I, you know, I, I I do agree with the report, and I think it's really um, the right way to go. But um, I guess um, I, I guess the question I like to, I don't know who's going to answer it. Maybe the clerk will answer it. Uh, uh, can there be respect with, uh, can we achieve respect when, uh, uh, given all the stuff that's been going on between members of council where, you know, there's complaints being lodged about this and about that and about that. Um, you know, these kind of things uh, generate a lot of uh, animosity and, and when there's animosity, the respect kind of goes out of the window. So I, I don't know how we achieve uh, uh, you know, being respectful to each other when, uh, when, the, the, you know, these uh, these these things happen, uh, where, um, and, and it's happened right across the board here, where I think there's been complaints about about every just about, about everyone here. Uh, back at you, okay. So you, or Pat, you're, I think you're only you're the only and Grant. I'm the glue. Yeah. So there's a, a few people that. Uh, there hasn't been any complaints uh, lodged um, by other members of council, so I, I guess you know I you know it's really nice to, uh, that we um, have this intent, but uh, I don't know how uh, hard it is to uh, achieve it, um, uh, Madam Chair, um, and uh, to the clerk. And I, who put that report together? Uh, who's responsible for that report? Yeah. 
Fiona. <laughs> Hi, Fiona. Would you, Fiona, yeah, do you want you like, to come forward? Would you like come down and kind of try to uh, guide us how we can be respectful to each other and uh, and still be able to, um, uh, you know, uh, still be able to do our, our jobs, I guess, uh, people expect us to do. Good morning, through uh, you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, foundationally, this report does speak to respect within our organization. It speaks to respect for staff, for elected officials, for all of our leaders to build that culture, and for individuals who come to uh, receive a program or service. We're here to demonstrate respect, and our hope is that we also gain respect back. I mean, ultimately, for people to have a respectful relationship, it takes two individuals and sometimes many more, depending on the nature of the circumstance. But it takes two individuals to really respect each other's perspective, to respect each other's values. Uh, so again, there's there's not a simple solution because it is very personalized, very individualized. But at the core, as an expectation of this organization, uh, and I you know look to our CAO who has been very clear in the messaging, is we expect everyone to demonstrate respect. And these policies and these practices, they extend to all individuals within the city and those individuals who access our services. Well, and I, and I understand that through the chair, but, you know, uh, when, when there's no, when we don't dem demonstrate respect here on, around this table, it, it's, it, it, there's a lot of focus on, uh, on us here, uh, within ourselves. And, and I know the mission statement is great, and, uh, and I know that, I believe that uh, there's been great respect between staff and council, and council and staff, you know, and employees, and um, and I, you know, I've never seen any anything else but that here around this table. But certainly, um, there, um, whenever we kind of get off the handle here, it does give the public a bad impression. And you know, having this mission statement, sometimes. Um, it's going to be hard to follow, given the dynamics of what goes on here. You know, so, Miss Peaceful, did you want to respond to that? <laughs> no, no, you're good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, Councillor Palesha. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you for this report. Um, I do. I really appreciate the the mission statement, and I guess it was it was uh, a little bit into last year um, that at the end of last year, or maybe in the mid last year, that um, our admins actually had an opportunity through. Um, uh, I know Teresa Olson had provided them with an opportunity to um, work together and and have some discussions with other areas in the city of Brampton, and the benefits that I heard that came from that. Were, were something that our admins had never really experienced before and you know meeting people like we have a huge organization here that you know people can meet you know every day for the first time it's 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 unreal that uh, so the ability that for you know the, that Teresa gave our admins to do that were was something that uh, that was really good for for our staff so my question is uh, with for the uh, the rest of the organization where are we because it's one thing to have a mission statement but it's another thing to actually you know walk the walk and and try and get you know uh, we talked about you know taking down the silos and uh, and I think we've done a good job at that but where is there opportunity for these people to actually get together work one on one basis from two separate uh, um, situations in the in the organization Uh, thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. Very good point. And that was a, an example that, uh, actually, I was speaking with Teresa yesterday, and she reminded me of, of some of the efforts to do that. So there's a few things we're going to do. Particularly around the respectful workplace, there's some resources that we will um, make available. E-learning, in-class sessions, communications that will be targeted to all employees, to all leaders, to elected officials. And in parallel, we're also looking at a diversity and inclusion strategy that we've just started working on. And diversity is really your mix of how you bring people and diversity of experiences and backgrounds. But inclusion is actually when you bring people together and you provide people the opportunity to, you know, almost walk in somebody else's shoes for a period of time. And that was a, a perfect example of bringing people together that may not formally you know informally they connect 
but you brought a formal um, opportunity for them to understand their, each other's challenges, their work priorities. And so within part of our diversity and inclusion strategy, we're going to be looking for those opportunities. And we've, we've actually been looking at some job shadowing programs. So it's very similar efforts that help <coughs> just create a sense of respect and a, and a sense of awareness of what we bring to the table. Excellent. That's great. Thanks, Madam Chair. Happy to move the report. Uh, thank you. I do have a, a question, Fiona, and thank you for the report. So members of council have a code of conduct, and um, which we're required to have, which really, um, you know, is it, pretty all-encompassing about what, what we can and, and cannot do, and if we breach that code, there are penalties. Um, what is there within the corporation if people act disrespectfully to one another or to a member of the public or even if a member of council acts disrespectfully to a member of staff? How, how, does, how do you deal with those through human resources? Thank you, Madam Chair, and very good question. So we have a few different mechanisms to do that. So within the respectful workplace policy, there's a very clear uh, process that outlines informal resolution, formal resolution. So depending on the nature of the, the, uh, the matter, the issue will help guide. Um, we also have an employee code of conduct. So there is an expectation that employees uh, behave in a manner that aligns with the employee code of conduct, that aligns with the respectful workplace. Uh, we're also, uh, we've also been going out to employees to say, what are the values that matter to them? What are those, those key principles that they're willing to stand up for? And we'll be bringing a report to council in, I think it's about eight weeks on that matter. So we have a number of pieces that help us to ensure alignment. In cases where there's disrespectful conduct, um, we undertake investigations. Uh, investigations are part of our business. And we look into what's the issue, what's the matter, and we come back with recommendations. How can people build a better working relationship? If somebody had some... Uh, behavior or action that caused concern, what's the way to get to some type of resolution so there's a productive working relationship? And again, f based on that foundation of respect. So we look to employee code of conduct and the respectful workplace policy when those issues happen. And that uh, is aligned when it's employee to employee, it's with a customer, uh, and so our leaders are and HR work very closely. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Okay, I have a motion then by Councillor Pelleche to um, move the recommendations. Let me just check. Move the recommendations in the report. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. Um, the next item is government relations matters. Oh, corp uh, questions before government relations. Is there any questions, Councillor Fortini? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think this is off would be for Commissioner Patari. Uh, on, on the OMB, I got many calls again on the Airbnb. Do we know if, if we're going to get this report quickly in because people are gonna, don't want to face all summer again or spring with these problems? And I got three calls yesterday on it because I've been telling them it's coming, it's coming. So. So through the chair, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the calls and the interest. We've had some preliminary meetings with staff. We're having an additional meeting on uh, this Friday uh, just to develop a very clear game plan so we can get back to you and to council in terms of what makes the most sense. Uh, Airbnb primarily uh, is a is a zoning bylaw issue and the zoning bylaw is not going to be fully reviewed probably for you know several years so that does not address some of the issues that we you know are facing as a city with respect to uh, some of the concerns that you're, you're identifying so what we're trying to do is develop a mitigation strategy that addresses either you know developing a, a unique bylaw related to uh, Airbnb or can we look at some of our existing bylaws and amend them to address some of these issues and we want to be able to come back and present that to council what makes the most sense to the interim to get over that recognizing more holistically the best way to deal with this through the zoning bylaw. So uh, and I appreciate that so we know what the Toronto did 
you know, have done that. So they, they amended the bylaw, they came up with a certain taxes on it. So at least we have the authority to say you cannot rent this house for weekends at the end of the day. You know, so maybe that, because, it, you know, a lot of the residents are worried, you know, like when you start having these different groups every weekend coming and going and garbage and parties and stuff like that, they can't enjoy their own backyards. So that's what they're worried. Thank you. Moving on then to government relations matters. Lowell, any, are there any questions on the information that Lowell has provided to members of council? Michael Palache. Uh, we had asked for the a report on the GTA walks. Is that mm -hmm. yes. coming to report? Yes. Or do you, Madam Chair? Yes. Through you, Madam Chair, I'll go uh, do my preamble short today, but on behalf of the government relations person here, uh, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> up until uh, last Friday, full disclosure, I was going to give you a rousing summary of all the meetings that are taking place tomorrow at Regional Council, but the announcement of the GTA West Corridor kind of cut that short, so I was told that I have to focus on that, so other than to say that next week or tomorrow is uh, Regional Committee Day, if you have any questions or thoughts that you would like any answers to, happy to provide those in advance of tomorrow. We're to start with the GTA West Corridor. This has been a long played out story with the province, the region of Peel, the city, um, as well as the town of Caledon and the region, I don't mean the region of Peel, but the broader uh, region in the 905 area. Um, I understand that this was raised this week at the planning committee, so I'm not while I may rehash some of the points there, um, staff in particular, um, uh, the Commissioner of Planning, really thought that just to kind of give you a little bit of a brief backup, like take a little step back, how do we get here, what do we know, uh, what's changed, uh, what we don't know, and uh, what we're doing. But overall, when we started to really reflect on this, I think what the province is doing is they're resetting the process here. They're, really, they're changing the rules of engagement about how we plan for this particular area. And for us, it's Northwest and Northeast uh, Brampton. I'm not going to focus a lot on the timeline because I'm sure everybody around this table really uh, appreciates where this started and where we are today. Um, but in reality, this started, this is probably about a 13, 14 year um, timeline to actually get to this point. It's taken a lot of um, uh, advocacy on the region's point as well as the city of Brampton to advocate, let's get through this EA process or eventually let's just get to an answer by the province. So even getting to that point has been a lot of AMOs, a lot of letters to the uh, Premier, to the Ministers about let's get a decision. So we finally have our answer. Um, when I talk about the what's changed piece, that's where I really want you to start thinking about this timeline because in 13, 14 years, the province, the world, and the, you know, the advancement of innovation and technology really has changed. So I'm going to try to tie a little bit of what's changed, not only from the province, but even within our own, what's within our control within the city, has changed since uh, 20, 2008 when the GTA West Corridor started. So what do we know? Um, we know that the province has taken the panel's advice to not go forward with the EA process. Um, the province, through the advisory panel, has decided that through their numbers and through a revised analysis that a highway is not necessarily the best approach for this corridor. And what they have done, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide, is now what they're going to be doing with the corridor is they're going to be evaluating it through a, pro, a study, the Northwest GTA Corridor Identification Study. And this is really, um, and then eventually this will get rolled up into the Golden Horseshoe Transportation Plan, which is being reviewed as we speak. So it's no longer going to be an EA process. Um, and they provided a little bit of timelines going forward. So they've actually started and, you know, talking to staff and kind of what we know is we weren't even aware of um, this, that the province has started going down this road. So between um, in December 2017, MTO as well as the utilities started to look at the study from a infrastructure, not only from a road perspective or from a transportation perspective, but also from a utilities perspective. We know that it's going to be a third the size of the original study area. Right now they're going to be protecting it for at least the next 9 to 12 months while the study initiates itself. Hopefully it's sooner. And just to be clear, they're not doing an EA study. But once they identify an actual route within that beautiful purple line, very rarely do I get to talk about maps, so this is actually quite exciting for me, um, around that, the new purple line that's been released by the uh, province. What we do know is that the corridor will probably fit within that purple line. 
And once that route is identified through this process, uh, then they will commence an EA study on that route. From a city of Brampton perspective, and thanks to planning as well as GIS for pulling, picking apart the uh, map that I just showed you about the implications for the city of Brampton. So we do know that development in the northwest and northeast Brampton is it's critical, and that's come out in so many different lenses here. Um, this decision really doesn't help alleviate the pressures there or the um, advance the projects. Um, so I think that's an important point for both northeast as well as northwest uh, Brampton. So what's changed? To give credit to the province, and I think this is even advocacy from when I was my time at the region as well as um, here at the city, it's really important for the planning processes to be integrated. So to be fair, the province has initiated a lot of um, planning processes, the Green Belt, provincial policy statements, the growth plan, uh, the big move in, 20, in 2006, as well as the more recently the Ontario's climate change policies. And one of the things that we've been advocating for is we wanted a more integration and we wanted more impacts around, you know, complete communities, building healthy communities, um, really addressing the um, impacts of climate change as it relates to all these planning documents. From my perspective, this is not a planning perspective, it just seems that while the GTA West Corridor EA was going, these planning documents were going and at no point did they actually align. So I think that's, from my perspective, that's kind of how we got here. It's the province was focusing on integration, they were focusing on the climate change, they were focusing on building complete communities, and the GTA West Corridor was happening in parallel without necessarily taking into account. And that's what some of the findings of the advisory panel found within their, um, their study. The second thing is the world of technology is changing. So we talk about autonomous vehicles. Um, when the mayor attended the big city mayor's caucus and as we, replay, um, as we um, outlined what we heard from there, it's companies and car manufacturers are actually ready to scale autonomous vehicle car riding programs. So things are moving at such a fast pace that again, because the GTA West Corridor started back in 2003, 2004, it never really accounted for the type of uh, technology. So again, these are some of the things that this listed here are some of the items that um, the report came out with as to why they decided um, the way they did. So what we don't know, so this is captured to on one slide or two slides, but they're very critical and staff really needs time to digest what does this decision actually mean for the city of Brampton, but again, for the region appeal, but also on, on a broader on a broader scale. So here are some things that we've um, identified, you know, uncertainty around what does this mean around Northwest and also Northeast Brampton? Um, how does this, um, when is the timing for this? So again, the study is just gonna be a year process, but the EA can go on for years again. So we're not really any closer um, to getting a final route through this important um, corridor. And the other things that we're talking about that we were starting to ask ourselves is because it comes around this council chamber so often is how does this impact the activity rate? Because employment is very critical for the future success of the city. And again, we really have to take a step back and really understand how, um, what impact does this have on us? So what we're doing, um, reading the panel's report once isn't good enough. I think we have to go back through it and dissect it even more. Um, through the commissioner of planning, we are reaching out to the province for more information around the study, but also we need to get clarifications. We have to understand how the study is going to be impacting us and what opportunities do we as a municipality, um, can we actually feed into that process? Because I think that it's important for us to um, have, a stay, um, have a place at that table if it's possible. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some questions around if we're not doing a highway, then what? Um, so talking to the planning staff, what's really important for us is now to take a look at this and do we have to revisit things like our transportation demand modeling that we did a number of years ago. Um, but we just have to do more than that. We have to make sure that what, the way we model is somewhat consistent with where the province is going or what they use for their modeling, which we don't know yet, um, because the two should be parallel, especially when we make a case as to what is the actual transportation infrastructure need uh, for this area. And the last thing is because we're talking about um, you know, the growth and development of you know, a very important and vital piece of land in, um, in Brampton is what impact does this have a from, from a financial perspective? So what kind of decisions do we have to make based on DCs, um, especially for um, <clears throat> as we go develop Northwest and Northeast Brampton? Oh, I guess I purposely, I guess, didn't uh, put a question slide in there, but happy to <laughs> <laughs> try to answer any questions or I have my colleagues just ran off on me. <laughs> oh, there he is. Perfect. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all for the report. Um, I, when I first heard of the report, there were a lot of uh, questions that uh, I think I was fielding as, as well as uh, ones that I had had. I did uh, have an opportunity to go through some of the report. It is massive. 
Um, so for anybody to go through it uh, more than once, my hat's off to them. I did pick out uh, in one uh, portion of the report under the quarter protection and other transportation needs that it, it states in there that the panel did not assess any work done by uh, the City of Brampton. And in other areas of the report, they do mention that the work that uh, they did look at, that, that Vaughn had done and Caledon, um, that's unfortunate that they uh, didn't have an opportunity because from what I was told and what I've seen, and this is why I asked for um, some kind of an overview of everything that we've done, uh, which will come later, uh, I assume, correct? Is still coming much later? Through the chair, as soon as we can get some answers to the same questions we have, as I'm sure members of council have, we will try to get back. Um, we're looking but just on the port part of, you know, just bringing council up to date with, you know, the start of everything that we've done up until now, and not like detailed, but uh, kind of a, a high level, thirty thousand feet scenario. Through the chair, we're anticipating to bring something forward with a little bit more detail for the March 5th planning committee. Hopefully by then we'll have some answers. Okay, great. Um, so just going back to you know, those remarks, it's unfortunate that uh, that they didn't have that opportunity. And I and I don't I don't fully understand why. I don't understand why Caledon was at the table with the province, York Region was at the table with the province, and Brampton wasn't. <coughs> specifically to the with the advisory panel. And all the work that we had done through studies and consultation, I don't know why. I don't. I don't understand that. I don't understand why they. You know, they said plain and and, and black and white there that they did not review Brampton's information. The advisory panel. Through the chair, I, I can't speak to why they chose those um, particular words to communicate back. Uh, the one thing is that the province does like working through the region of Peel that represents the three area municipalities here in Peel, and that's mm -hmm. their, their preference, whether there was some language in there that kind of missed that. Uh, it's certainly something I would like to dive into and report back on. Yeah, it actually says um, that they didn't, the, pan, the, Peel, the panel did not review um, uh, Peel region's uh, information mm -hmm. as well. So, um, there are the, you know, the, your, the what we don't know slide. Um, I think we, you know, we may know more now than, um, than we did. We do have uh, other questions, uh, new questions came up, but what we do know is, and it states in the report that, you know, they identify the need for the municipalities to, um, co to continue the work in the areas um, that the alignment or the area that uh, they've um, they've made a lot smaller uh, and and opened up um, for development and, and and whatnot. We know that we need a 400 series highway or we need a, a four lane, six lane high, um, road, regional road out there. We don't know whether they're going to be building it or not, but we already know, and our studies have shown for for the best employment lands. Um, that it needs to be where we have said that it needs to be. So I think work needs to begin on 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 looking at um, putting that road somewhere. I think I think what this what this does accomplish is we now have the ability to actually do something in specifically in the Northwest Brampton. Also, I have a question about um, <clears throat> you know they they do not. They do not identify uh, whatever they're going to be building and where it's going to be crossing the credit. And now that it, it within that area, it has the potential to cross the credit and then the gas line twice. And those are some of the questions that I have as well. When we talked about, when we had studies um, looking at the least amount of environmental impact, and now that whatever's going in that corridor now, uh, potentially has uh, the you know the worst impact on the environment, but I know we don't know what essentially is going in there. Um, I guess my my question is, you know, when are we going to be able to comment on, um, in particular, the studies that Brampton has done and the uh, impact to the environment that uh, that's now going to be in that corridor? 
So through the chair, one of the first questions I've posed to the province without a response to uh, as yet is whether or not this purple line is in fact just a conceptual line anyways. I don't know how detailed this mapping is. We've asked for detailed mapping and we haven't seen anything. Um, for all we know, this could be a stroke of a pen to say in this area. Uh, if you look closely, uh, the mapping seems to align right on top of Heritage Road as well, which is something that we hadn't contemplated as being as a, a location for a higher order network. So, you know, those are some foundational questions we've got to get some answers to, and then we'll be in a better position to understand uh, what the thought was behind this and what the plans are. And I said it on Monday, and if, it, if it's determined that Heritage Road, it, it is going on Heritage Road, although there are a number of forests in there, and I don't know if they identify those, um, you know, I, 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 don't know, I don't know what if that's better than, than any other area. I would assume that uh, putting any kind of network already on top of a road would probably be beneficial to, um, to the region. I just don't know how, you know, I, I think it would be expensive due to, you know, the expropriation rather than, you know, there's a lot of houses on Heritage Road as opposed to, you know, going through uh, any types of fields. So through the chair, the, the one thing we want to reiterate is that it's, it seems to us that there's no commitment that this is even potentially a road at this point. Right. Um, they're looking at, uh, you know, transmission of electricity and other utilities. Uh, it's kind of silent on whether it would be any kind, of, um, any kind of road or some other kind of higher order transit is what they've spoken to. Other modeling work had been done that would suggest the Heritage Road or the existing road network was, uh, was not really the alignment of a higher order transit network. So I don't know if it was deliberate that this purple line falls on top of Heritage Road or, again, we've, we've got to get some detailed mapping and a better understanding of what the, the thought was behind this. So I've heard some some um, people mention that they've they've taken an opportunity and and, and done an overlay of of what um, what the province uh, released to try and get a better understanding of where that is. But are you saying that it it has the potential to not be exactly where that area has been shaded? Through the chair, I'm I'm saying I don't know if this is detailed detailed mapping or simply conceptual. We've asked through the ministry if, if it is in fact conceptual. I haven't heard uh, responses yet. Okay. I guess, and I still have some other questions with, which relates to the work that we had, um, that we have done, but I'll, I'll kind of wait. I don't know if that actually looks like, you know, there's a lot of work to be, um, that, we, that we had done, and for council to have a better understanding of what, you know, specifically the new, newer councillors, um, I don't know if that looks like a, a workshop or or what. I don't know, but yeah, I leave it up to you to tell me what, uh, how long, and what that looks like. Through the chair, one of the uh, items that we're certainly looking for greater clarity on is the assumptions about moving people. If the province has an interest in some other higher order transit, how do you shift people from a road oriented uh, community to something that would be look different from that? And uh, that's something we're anxious to hear from the province on. Right, but goods movement is, is was the big thing at the region that, you know, the region had said, and David, you may want to, you know more than, than I about, you know, the region coming forward to say we need a, this is the highway or the service level that we need to provide out there, um, and essentially this is where it kind of needs to go. So it's we still need to do something at the regional level. We still need to put something in there for goods movement. Can deal with this. Sorry, through the chair. Um, oh, you came from the region, Rob. Pardon right. me. Yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> the, the, the region had contemplated, a, I'll call it a bit of a backup plan, that an arterial road would be uh, a minimum. Mm -hmm. And that was based on previous assumptions about how to move people and goods. So in your development charge bylaw, there was an element. Uh, it's not the fulsome collection of a network north to south or anything like that. But there is some money is being collected through the development charge program which could contribute to an arterial road. At this point, I don't think there's much in the pot that would fund a, uh, a vast road network, um, but it's going to have to uh, be revisited clearly about what the needs are and how to fund that through the region as well in the, free in the future. Is the region the sole collector on that? There are some elements on the southern end for a, uh, a, the local road network that would flow into that. Um, but uh, yeah, the Bramus Parkway specifically is what we are collecting for. Uh, but again, it's, it had been contemplated as a, not a replacement for this uh, highway network. So there, there's uh, you know, some work to be done in terms of what would really suffice to serve the community. 
Okay. On, in your, my last question through you, Madam Chair, uh, to you, Rob, um, what's the, what's the, what are the positives that, that came from this report in terms of, you know, how we conduct business and service levels and whatnot? Through the chair, I think there, there's an interesting dialogue that's going to happen about how we shift people out of cars onto other modes of transit, how we design communities to be less car oriented, and this is where I think the province is coming from. So I think there's great opportunity to actually think broadly about the future and how communities are designed. Certainly goods movement is an element of that, but I think that the car oriented um, plans that we've seen in the past are, are going to be plans of the past. Well, we have, but we already knew that. We've already been developing uh, communities that weren't sufficient. Where? Mount Pleasant Village. With what? 1.2 per per unit. Like, where where across Canada has that, is that already be, being implemented? Other than Toronto. And I don't even know if it is in Toronto. The amount of wards in Mount Pleasant. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Councillor Sprothieri. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Rob, uh, do you know who sat on the uh, this panel that came up with this recommendation? Uh, sort of people were the environmentalists, traffic experts, uh, futuristic thinkers. Um, uh, what are these other people who can uh, uh, kind of through the, the track. future? I actually don't have in front of me the list of the members, uh, but there was definitely a slant on environmental um, protection of conservatism. There was environmental lawyers and and the like, but uh, I could furnish you with that if you'd like. Well, I, and I was aware of that, that there was a lot of environmental kickback on this from environmentalists. Um, and I, I have... Um, <laughs> now, I, you know, uh, I know that um, perhaps this group environmentalists had some great intentions, but uh, I don't think that they were very realistic. Um, you know, you look at um, all the big cities of the world, and more advanced than, than us here in Peel Region, and they still have a car, and they still, you know, lots of traffic jams everywhere you go. I know a lot of them have, you know, high, high train transportation, and you know, that stuff, but they still have huge congestion problems. Uh, and uh, so I think they were, I, I believe that they were out to lunch, these people who have made this recommendation. So what I suggest, I, I think what we should do, and I believe there's, uh, you know, maybe there's more practicality in, uh, and maybe some of the other political parties, and uh, I believe that we should send a resolution to the uh, NDP and Conservative uh, transportation critics say that we believe that this uh, was a terrible decision. They haven't really put anything on the table uh, to tell us how they're going to uh, move people around, whether it's going to be maybe Star Trek uh, technology where they're going to transport people from a booth into another booth somewhere. Uh, you know, And um, maybe they know something we don't know. Uh, maybe they have some alien technology already in the works, you know, the government. Uh, that uh, is waiting to be implemented, you know. But and, and that that would be great if they had that. But you know, I I don't think we're there yet. And I believe that uh, this corridor was extremely important to uh, both Brampton and Caledon, and uh, probably York Region and Halton. And so I I would I would move a motion to say that uh, we send a and I you know hopeful that. Uh, We'll see what happens in May with the election, and uh, maybe uh, if uh, one of the other parties may end up at the top, uh, maybe they they're they're more practical and they revisit this whole matter. So I like to suggest that we move a motion, uh, put a motion together, uh, maybe for council, and uh, that bring it to us, and so with some words where we express our disappointment in the decision, uh, with no real. Um, suggestions on how to uh, deal with future growth and future transportational um, needs and um, and ask that the, uh, the two <coughs> opposition parties um, that for them to reconsider uh, this decision that this government has made. So I'd like to move that motion, Madam Chair. Okay. Mr. Clark. Um, 
Can we move a motion in the governance section? Okay, thanks. Yeah, and we should also send a, a, a motion to the the, the, uh, the minister, the present minister, expressing our disappointment in their decision. And okay. I think that should be included too. Okay, Councillor Gibson, you're next. Thank you, Madam Thank you. Um, have we um, have we reached out to the property owners in that area yet to find out, uh, or just to work with them to see what they have, to see what their reaction is being before they start lining up here to see what we're doing and send their lawyers after us and all that kind of stuff. Um, have we done any of that yet, or will we be doing all that? So we they may you know we don't know a lot, but they probably don't know a lot either. But maybe together we can uh, figure this out. Through the chair, as yet, I haven't reached out other than some communications with some some of their uh, legal representatives. But uh, my plan would be to uh, to engage a couple of the the representatives from the area to have some high level discussions on what this means. Okay, I just hate to see them all of a sudden start lining up here and and asking us questions and things like that the things that we don't know we don't have answers for. So if we're if we're working together with them, maybe there's a way we can uh, try to understand this whole thing. Um, when we were in Ottawa at AMO, did um, I know we had um, an opinion on on the whole corridor thing? Did I, I can't remember. The, did we meet with the opposition parties on our on our vision for the corridor? Did we did we express at that time? I can't remember. Uh, through chair to uh, the councillor, um, it was part of our um, our package for AMO. But we raised um, the issue of governance and health care during the meetings with the um, with the opposition, both uh, NDP and PC. Um, I also know that the region of Peel had a delegation with uh, Minister Del Duca at the time, the Minister of Transportation, where yep. he announced that or he indicated that an announcement on the GTA West corridor was going to be imminent. So you know, fast forward yep. six months, imminent is different. Um, the one point, I just going back to the resolution and just. For just information out there, with even though there's changes within the PC party, when they released their platform, one of the items in that original platform um, was around the GTA West corridor and around continuing it. Now, given the change in leadership, they pulled that document back now because it's really up to the next leader. So again, the resolution could be timely because as they whoever is the appointed the new leader, this could influence um, their policy direction or at least ensure that the PC party um, continues down that path so yeah I, I remember being uh, with the region when we presented I'm just wondering if maybe it might be just as simple as reiterating to the opposition parties and the party in that um, we still stand by our original views um, along with the region appeal that this is needed it's needed now not necessarily you know doesn't it shouldn't be really put off to the future if we don't if the government and we don't start looking at what this is um, now it, we're never going to get anywhere like I, I think about Chinkuzi Road which I'm very familiar with um, because I front on it when I first moved onto Chinkuzi Road it was a two lane highway but um, because I'm on council, I knew that both the region and the city need, know, knew that Chinkuzi Road had to be um, widened and, and was going to be a type of corridor, maybe not a provincial corridor or, or a, a regional corridor, but um, it's now a, basically a six-lane highway for, you know, it's a very big roadway. And it's very busy. It, the, the day that it got expanded, it became very, very busy. So, um, the longer we put the, we put anything off, um, in particular the um, the east-west um, roadway, the longer we put it off, the longer it takes to get done. So we need. I think we need a real position going forward um, to back what the region has been trying to do on Calden. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Moore. Thank you. Um, just want to speak on what I, I think Councillor Sprovieri's put a motion forward. I I feel. Do you want me to read it? 
Um, the motion? If you want to. Sure. That'll give you clarification. That staff be directed to prepare a draft motion for consideration at the City Council meeting of February the 21st, voicing the City's concern and requesting reconsideration of the decision to uh, dis discontinue the GTA West Corridor Environmental Assessment. Okay. Um, I know we're all concerned about this from, you know, the perspective of moving people and goods around, but the problem I have with I've, with the motion as it's written is that we don't know enough details on the new plan. If we knew the details of the new plan and we could compare the two and say the old one was better, um, you know, even though it hadn't been finalized, it was better than what's being proposed. But I think for us to sort of say put the old one back on the table is is premature. I, I do think, however, that staff um, at the appropriate time should prepare a motion for us that is based on your best recommendation uh, given your understanding of what the old plan was going to achieve and what the new one is proposing to achieve. So, Councillor Sporvieri, I don't disagree with you, but I disagree from the perspective that we don't know what the new one looks like. And maybe it's better and maybe it's not. But we can't make that judgment right now. So to have staff prepare a motion, I can't prepare, I, I can support a motion that says, um, put the old one back on the table because I don't know. So, but but a motion that directs staff to prepare a motion at the appropriate time when more information is available might be a better direction so that we're not sending staff off at that time to prepare the recommendation, but we'll actually deal with more information on the details of the new plan and the motion at the same time. So, I don't know. So if I could just cl see clarification, I think the commissioner had indicated that he would be reporting back on the report um, around March the 5th, and I would expect at that time you would, you would be able to provide counsel with your expert opinion as to the recommendations in the report going forward. So do you see that as a more appropriate time then for us to take a position? Through the chair, we're hopeful we'll have more information by March 5th. I'm not sure if we will. Um, so we could work towards that date. Um, whether or not we're going to have a lot of these answers questioned by then, um, it's not clear to me. Okay. So that isn't helpful. <laughs> Sorry. Councillor Sprovieri? Well, actually, I'm still on the okay. board because I have another question that's sort of along that. It, we know the provincial government's come, uh, provincial election is coming. We have... Time's up. We have um, we've been doing on, ongoing advocacy uh, to the degree that we've never done it in the past, thanks to um, you know bringing on Lowell, who's better preparing us. But what is our election strategy specifically? Are we going to have something that um, sort of pulls all of this together? Because it's one thing we know what the government's doing. You say that the, uh, the was it the People's Guarantee? I think the whatever the Conservatives were calling theirs, um, but it might just be sitting in abeyance. I'm not getting the sense that there's going to be dramatic changes in that. Um, who knows? But um, you know, I guess there's the question: How are we preparing ourselves for an election strategy with all three? Party positions. Uh, through you, Chair, uh, to the Councillor, um, February 28th, Committee of Council. It's the date I'm targeting for to propose election strategy. Um, within that, there's already been work. Everything that we've been doing from an advocacy point has kind of been building up to that. So the AMOs, the pre budget submissions, the ongoing dialogues to the GR um, updates. Uh, my intention is to prov um, propose four themes. So one will be around governance, one will be around transportation. Um, health as well as innovation, so touching on to the work that we're doing through um, um, the university as well as, I guess, Centre ICE, I heard. 
in the, um, oh, in the morning. Um, and then within that, there's going to be a, a toolbox of opportunities, so communicating with each of the, uh, the, the major political parties. Um, also having the candidates here, I'm going to propose having the candidates here for a little one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so we can actually kind of flesh out some of those details and get a commitment from them, not just what the party will be doing, but also what them they will be doing as a representative. And other tools in terms of um, leveraging communication, social media, and but I'll also be drilling down what the um, proposed um, issues could be. So we can't go after everything, but I think what I've heard, there's a way to consolidate them and lump them into at least those for four, four proposed themes. Um, f thank you very much. I um, mean, clearly we're positioned better this time than we've, I think we've ever been, in, you know, certainly during um, the recent past. But um, so sort of following along the theme of breaking down the silos, all of those areas that you talk about are, while they have a specific goal within those, they all complement each other. So as we, as we do the advocacy, we need to link them all together. And I think the value of doing that is that, you know, we did the presentation, or the, the mayor did the presentation for the provincial uh, budget that was being put together. And, um, but there's federal funding as well. I think if we, if we approach this from the perspective that we're not just looking at one project, that it's, you know, it's sitting there, it's, it's isolated, it actually, everything that we're doing has been strategic in terms of city building, whether it's center ice, whether it's the Zoom, whether it's the, uh, the uh, EAs on the alternative alignments, whether it was the Amazon bid, the river walk, all of this ties together and, um, and supports um, all those other goals. So if, I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but rather than just dealing with the river walk in isolation, the river walk is just one piece of downtown intensification, the Zoom transit, the, you know, all those kinds of, it tr the trans supports the transit hub in the downtown, and so on. So how, how do we build that package? I mean, you're the guy to do it um, with the team here, but. Thank you. Um, it's a, um, through you, Chair, to the Councillor, it's, uh, it's a big question. Um, I hope when I come back, and like, actually let me just take a step back. Thank you, because that's exactly how we've been thinking about it from our strategic plan, especially when we made the pivot. It's you can't look at the six themes in isolation. They, they're all connected in some fashion. So when you take a look at them, some of the strengths are strong, some are a little bit weak, some there are in connections. But if you look at the planning vision, the urban vision, sort of the urban centers to Riverwalk, to regional connections, um, to Riverwalk, and I'm missing one, um, Health, health partnerships and the university, which I think is innovation, it's, um, they all cross, they all touch on economic development in some fashion. So through the election strategy, my hope is, while there's four themes, is to really start telling the stories, what we're doing and the investments that you're making. It's really around building the legacy. So we're making some decisions now, but we know we need a provincial partner, we need a federal partner. The GTA West corridor is a key piece as we continue to build and we continue to um, construct the vision that we have for um, uh, the city of Brampton that's being led through like you know the planning vision and Larry Beasley so you're right they're all connected and hopefully through the advocacy strategy and the story I would propose to the next government of Ontario can hopefully start to how does the river walk fit into downtown reimagine how does it leverage you know the mobility hubs how does it touch on to all these various components and you know climate change river walking you know, flood mitigation um, it it's huge and I've heard this around the table, like it really is the piece that's going to unlock economic development. So they're all interconnected in some way. One of the challenges is how do we do that visually? So hopefully the election strategy and the other work that we're doing can start to, to piece all those together. And, and just to go back to the report that Commissioner Patari had on the table today, pulling it all together supports the objective of the application that we'll put together. Uh, for that as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Spravieri, your motion is on the floor. Okay, I hope you'll be brief. We do have oh, another yeah. council meeting. Yeah, I will. Okay. Well, I, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, waiting for the province to uh, give us more details. I, you know, they didn't ever, did they say when they're going to provide some more details or their um, uh, plan of what the, the transportation 
that we're going to look like in the, uh, in the next few months? Through the chair, I, I haven't heard back at a bit of immediate plans, but I suspect through their study period, which they've identified as 9 to 12 months, hopefully we'll be at the table and have further insights. But in terms of, you know, this week or next week with more details, I, I'm not convinced they've got more to give me. But that's something that uh, I'm looking forward to having a discussion with them. Well, you know, I, I think it, uh, it's wise to send a motion to the opposition. By that time, the, uh, the election will have happened in May. Uh, and then, uh, and then let uh, the um, um, let whoever is doing the, the study come up with their uh, vision. If it's if it's practical to the new government, and I hope there will be a change. If it's practical to them, then they can continue with uh, with whatever vision, the new vision. If not, then they know our position here in Brampton. We're concerned that uh, they've stopped this uh, process without having any any. Any real, uh, not, uh, no uh, substantial proposals on how to deal with the future traffic. You know, so, okay. So we have a motion on the floor that's been moved by Councillor Sprovieri. Um, uh, basically, that staff be directed to prepare a draft motion for consideration and bring it back to council. Okay. All in favor of the, that motion? I just read it a few seconds ago. The whole thing. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's sure. carried. Thank you very much. And then I believe we are at the end of the agenda. I'm not going to take this line down. Uh, public question period. There is a 15 minute limit on uh, questions, but any member of the public can come forward um, and ask a question regarding any decision that was made at this meeting. So if there's anybody here who would like to speak, please come forward, state your name, and ask your question. Hello, my name is Sylvia. I'm a resident near the Kennedy and Steeles intersection. The council had talked about transit situation for downtown because of the university. I've looked through a whole bunch of city documentation, and there does not seem to be much planning for the long term on how Brampton anticipates doing transportation for the anticipated 200,000 more people to arrive in Brampton by 2031. That sounds like a long time, but that's 13 years. Okay, so I don't believe that item was on our agenda. Okay, it's for so downtown. How, what are there plans to do it for that, for the 1,000 university students or more? Okay, so um, the CAO, Mr. You'll talk to him? Okay, good, good. The CAO is going to uh, clarify for you. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we have no more questions then. Um, we have, we do, it's a special council meeting that we have not, okay, at one o'clock. Oh, at one o'clock. Okay. Here in the chambers. Okay, so um, we're going to adjourn now, and our next regular meeting is Wednesday, February 28th. There is no in camera. It's a special task meeting. Okay. Okay, meeting is adjourned.